how can you invest in continents? Making active choices to eat more fibre, as boring as that sounds, could be easy, like having some veggies and dip at beer o'clock instead of chips or cheese. Drinking a good amount of water each day, maybe fewer coffees and soft drinks. I'm not going to suggest you cut down on alcohol, but you may want to think about it. Exercise is important, like walking for half an hour a day. And your pelvic floor, one set of muscles that directly affect your continence, not just for women, but benefit men as well. I'm not planning to spend my retirement anywhere but at home. And that trip to Europe we booked. Invest in continence. Visit continence.org.au or call the National Continence Helpline. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's final presentation of the Continents Foundation of Australia's Continents Week celebration of investing in continents. Now, um, I'm delighted to have you with us today and, and to let you know that today is about uh, consolidating all the topics that we've looked at throughout the week. So we have had a focus on nutrition, on exercise, on the pelvic floor and good toilet habits. And we've received lots of questions throughout the previous four days. And so today we're going to actually um, ask those questions that you have submitted to our expert panel. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the traditional custodians on the land on which we're meeting today. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging of all of Australia's Indigenous peoples. Now, just a few housekeeping notes so that you can be active participants in today's webinar. You've joined via Zoom and at any time during today's webinar, you have the opportunity to submit further questions for our presenters. Just type your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of the control panel on your screen. And then if time allows, and if the question hasn't been covered earlier, we will hopefully present this to our expert panel for a response. Um, if we are unable to um, answer all the questions, these will be passed on to our expert panellists and we will be doing our very best to answer them um, uh, through another mechanism. So keep your eyes open on um, any alerts or um, information that we're able to add to our website. If you do have a question that's perhaps of a more personal nature and not suitable for a public webinar, um, then I recommend that you call our National Continents Helpline. Now, the number for that is 1800 33 0006. And you will be able to talk direct to an experienced continence nurse advisor and they will be able to help you and provide you with information around where you can go to get the uh, exact support that you require. Uh, for people watching on Facebook live stream, unfortunately, uh, you're not able to interact with today's session in quite the same way, but you will still be able to forward through questions. Now, finally, we will be recording today's webinar and it will be available on demand via both Zoom and Facebook uh, throughout the remainder of World Continents Week. And then beyond that, it will be available on the Foundation's YouTube channel. Now, of course, an event like today doesn't happen without the wonderful services of our expert panellists, and it's my pleasure to introduce them through to you today. The first member of our panel that I'd like to introduce is Meryl McPhee. Now, Meryl is a continence nurse advisor, and she works at the Continents Foundation of Australia. So I had the great pleasure of calling her a close colleague. Um, she has been working at the Foundation um, on the National Continents Helpline for about 15 years now um, and she's also worked in the acute age care and in dementia care. So welcome Meryl, thank you so much for your time today. 
Thank you. Our second presenter that I'd like to uh, welcome is Therese, or as we lovingly call her, Terry Wesley. And Terry is a physiotherapist. But more than that, Terry is actively involved in the work of the Victorian Continence Resource Centre and is their executive officer. So she comes with over 30 years of experience in the area of pelvic floor health. And we welcome you today, Terry. And Hi. finally, but certainly not least of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. T. Wan Ong. TJ, as he's affectionately known, is a geriatrician at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and he consults in the Continence Clinic there. He conducts urodynamic studies and education research and has a very keen interest in the areas of dementia and BPSD management. And we thank uh, TJ for his time today. Thanks for now having with me. those, you lovely to have you with us. And now, with those introductions out of the way, the really important part of our day starts where I get to ask lots of questions. So, um, the first one I'm going to ask today is around uh, diet, and this is um, aimed at a senior who is 90 plus. So perhaps this one goes to you first, TJ. Um, and it's where a 90 plus person has faecal incontinence and cognitive impairment and doesn't like drinking water. They're barely able to walk with a frame and they have no energy. And the question is, any tips that you can share? Oh, I think this is, thank you very much, Bronwyn. This is a very um, difficult, it is a challenging situation I can uh, appreciate. And I think this is maybe not just myself, but maybe Meryl and Terry will, uh, will be able to help me out here too. Uh, look, I think you, um, the, 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 the three main ways I can think of uh, is really about uh, optimizing uh, three, uh, three sort of domains. If I were to uh, extrapolate this, not just with bowel incontinence, but also urine incontinence, we want to firstly optimize bladder and bowel uh, together. Uh, I also say that we will try to op optimize the, uh, the dementia side of things as well, as best as you can. And then the third section is really about optimizing the carer and the environment. Now, um, so for example, if, the, if it's about the bladder and the bowel, I think you want to make sure that uh, this pers uh, the person can be um, encouraged to drink uh, as much as they will tolerate, uh, as much as they like. Sometimes it's about having small amounts of uh, intake rather than trying to get a large amount in. Uh, sometimes it's right. about um, understanding which, what sort of things people might like to drink uh, and if it's uh, something uh, enjoyable, sometimes you might have to water it down a little bit if it's something quite sugary or it's a very high caffeine. Um, but that might be sufficient. Uh, otherwise, it's about being creative, perhaps with some fruits um, or, um, uh, or vegetables or high. Uh, that, that might be helpful. Um, if it's about the bowels, uh, understanding that the person's not constipated, uh, we can uh, assess this with, uh, you know, uh, quite easily about whether there's a passage of heart stools uh, or whether this is an infrequent passage of stools. And sometimes it's about adding uh, some fiber into the diet, uh, maybe perhaps not so um, uh, in a manner that they choose. Laxatives can be also an option, uh, perhaps. Uh, and if uh, we talk about optimizing the dementia, it's about making sure that a person feels very safe um, and, uh, and comfortable uh, with, the, uh, uh, with uh, where they are at, um, where uh, and, and sometimes it's about um, what we call non-pharmacological management strategies in terms of how we approach the person uh, feeling safe um, and, and, uh, and then also about the care and the environment. Thanks, TJ. Um, am I right in suggesting that there are a lot of foods that this person could potentially have that do have a high fluid content? So it's sort of that sneaky way of getting fluids into to somebody who, who won't drink? Yes, I've, I think that's a, a good idea. Um, things like custards and you know, those sorts of things um, can actually give extra, extra fluid. Mm -hmm. Ice cream, although you do have to be a little bit careful with sugar content, depending on what else is going on. 
um, if they've got any other chronic medical condition that may be affecting them, uh, for example, diabetes, um, that could be part of the issue. Um, also to looking at um, possibility of timed toileting so that uh, you try and keep a maybe a bowel diary for a while to see when the episodes of faecal incontinence occur on the loose stool and see if you can preempt it by taking them to the toilet prior to that or 20 to 30 minutes after a meal so that you're, you're getting into a better, better routine. And as um, TJ said, um, looking at whether it's constipation or with overflow possibly or, and managing that or whether it's actually a loose stool that they need a little bit of fiber added to. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at the diet, things like um, cheese, all the, what tend to be some of the worst things for you, cheese and uh, bananas and mashed potato and white rice and white bread, which sort of um, absorb some of the liquid content, make it a little bit easier for them. Mm. Adding something like Benefiber too can be helpful, but it's, it's important to do it as an individual. So you're looking at the individual and working out the best plan for them. Thanks, Meryl. We have a I similar have question. Sorry. I have one more tip in that drinking is a social activity. And so often with elderly people, we give them a drink and stand and watch them and expect to drink. And if we can encourage them to drink as a social activity, so, um, you know, pour yourself a drink as well and drink together. Um, and every time there's a new person who comes into the facility to visit, whether it's a physiotherapy running an exercise class or um, a, a family member, or the grandchildren, they all need to have a drink and offer a drink, so they drink together. Thank you, Terry. Um, there's a, a similar question, but this one is where the person um, is on a restricted fluid intake diet because of low sodium and potassium levels. Um, how can these individuals prevent constipation? is a, a single factor it's yeah. a multifactorial issue and you'd need to look at not just their drinking but everything else that tj mentioned earlier mm -hmm. um optimizing the diet uh optimizing fiber intake even activity can affect constipation mm -hmm. so it's not just about the fluid Okay. Uh, from a medication perspective, I think it's about the doctor um, then looking at the medicate the list of medicines that people are on, and sometimes uh, things can be um, either is or substituted or whether the dose could be reduced or alternatives um, to see if that might help change the, uh, the the level of constipation. And if that's not sufficient, then it's about you know supplemental fiber. There's about there's laxatives or maybe even suppository um, on a either as required basis or more as a regular basis. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the fluids, I think it's about uh, being as, uh, you know, drinking as much as you can up to the fluid restriction. Mm -hmm. It is necessary, uh, but as much okay. as you can. So this notion around how much fiber and how much fluid should be taken in, a, in a, a day seems to be an ongoing theme through a lot of the questions we've received this week. And so, you know, as we're aging, what do we term as being how much is the correct fiber, how much is the correct amount of fluid that you should be having? Um, is there a, a, a rule of thumb around that? Meryl, I might ask you that one. Okay. Um, Fluid-wise, we usually suggest four to six drinks in a day, a variety of fluids. So it's not just four to six, uh, you know, four to six drinks of water and then everything else on top of that, um, which can be a bit overwhelming. So maintaining that good fluid intake certainly makes a difference. And it's, I think it's 30 grams of fibre per day, which is quite quite a large volume. So um, most people would get that in fruit and vegetables so that you're not having to add extra things, but um, things like kiwi fruit and dates and prunes, those sorts of things um, are good for and, and healthy for bowel as well. Mm, thank you. We try and keep it natural if we can. We, you know, it's better if you don't have to have medication, but 
it's always wise to check with your GP or your specialist to see what might be appropriate in your given mm -hmm. circumstance or situation. Um, thank you. Fact that people often forget is the legumes. Mm -hmm. um, they're so they're so good for us in so many ways, and they're really rich in fibre. So if you're trying mm -hmm. to reduce the amount of sugar, so you don't want too much fruit, legumes are a great source of fibre. That's uh, a good suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very. Um, so there's a couple of themes coming through, and this is another one that um, is, it's sometimes a difficult topic to talk about when we're looking at diet, but um, people are noticing that they're uh, creating more gas, more wind, um, and it's often to an excessive amounts. Um, and so there's a link there with some of the high fiber foods. Um, also that food tolerance, things that people used to be able to um, eat merrily without any excessive wind, they're now finding as they're getting older, um, they are experiencing a lot more uh, wind. And is the use of supplement probiotics, um, you know, worth considering? Ooh, I'll leave that to TJ. <laughs> well, um, hard questions there. It's a can of um, worms. Oh, wow. There's many questions there. Um, I think the, the thing about uh, as, as, as people, uh, as an older person, um, the, um, uh, the body changes, obviously. And so sometimes it's about um, the, the speed of the, um, the bowels. So it's not as quick as it used to, um, to, to sort of push things along. Uh, the other things are also about the, the absorption of these um, of these elements of the uh, of food, and so sometimes it's not as digested or not as uh, as absorbed as best as before. So sometimes it change the, the gut flora changes um, over time. Uh, the other things are also about medications, which can be uh, related to uh, uh, changes to the gut flora, the gut motility. Um, the other issues are, of course, about the numerous um, or, or the different number of uh, medical conditions that a person has, uh, which may also alter that. So there are quite a lot of number of reasons for, for all this, um, but not all. Uh, if it occurs, then I think it's about then I'm trying to understand what can we do. Um, and if there are certain uh, triggers that can be identified, uh, whether it's certain types of food or whether it's after certain uh, meals or meal times, perhaps, or uh, how fast a person eats, um, uh, then I think then that's about uh, understanding individually that that's uh, a trigger and then trying to, in a systematic way, try to identify them and try to uh, eliminate those things. Uh, Meryl or Terry, have you got any uh, other suggestions? Another um, option is that particularly if it's happening as you're getting older um, and it's not necessarily always triggered by a food, people always try and label a food because they've read a lot about food triggers. Mm -hmm. um, it may be a food trigger, but it could also be that you're constipated. So if you're constipated, the bacteria in your gut have longer to ferment the food. They'll produce more gas. And a lot of people I see with excessive flatus, when we correct their defecation dynamics, we help them to actually listen to their bodies a little bit better, empty when the stool is there, when they feel the urge, not hold on for prolonged periods of time, and empty well. And so many older people land up with higher and higher and to higher toilet seats. And I'm a physio, I used, to, I used to provide those without realizing that if you perched up on a high toilet seat, your bowels actually don't empty that well. So you've got a bit of a backlog, you've got um, more time for the bacteria to have a go. And I took the um, option of bringing a prop. So if you simply use a little footstool when you're sitting on that high toilet seat, it can really help you get into a better permit mm. position. A lot of that gas will come out while you're defecating which means it's less of a problem later on. And these sort of things are lightweight, so you don't stand on them because you'll trip. Once you've done your business, you need to push them in under the toilet, out of the way, or move them to the side before you stand up. We don't want this webinar to cause a couple of hip fractures. So please be careful. If you are using a step, 
don't step on it unless it's really, really solid and OT or physio or nurse has actually said it's okay. Most of the time they're designed to be put out of the way. But simple, simple um, things like taking your time on the toilet, emptying well, um, not rushing, not delaying. These can be very, very helpful tactics. Thanks, Terry. We're going to have a little shift in, in our themes now and we're going to have a look at the personal toileting habits and some queries around those. And I have several that are around the same theme and that's um, delay the urge or delaying the urge to urinate. Now, one in particular has sparked my interest. It's from a classroom teacher. And as an old classroom teacher, I remember my joy in finally leaving classroom teaching and going to a job where I could go to the toilet when I needed to. So there are several questions around training a bladder for those extended, uh, extended periods between visits to the toilet. For the teacher, it's very much around timing your toileting to go with the recess and lunchtime bells. But then what are the risks associated with holding on to urine? Um, for example, can you develop uh, a UTI risk? So I would want to start with you on that one, Terry. Um, so there, there are a lot of it depends to that answer. There is no harm in holding on for a length of time, providing you're not over distending your bladder. So it's useful to actually um, go onto the Continence Foundation website and look up some simple facts like, how much should my bladder hold? And we know that, we know it's somewhere between one and two cups. So very easy measure. If you're holding on and when you're absolutely busting and you get there and it's about two cups, you're probably doing absolutely no harm. However, I have met some particularly people in retail teaching and nursing who have habitually held on until their bladder is holding over a litre. And what that eventually does is overstretches the bladder and damages the muscles and the nerve endings in the bladder. So you don't want to overstretch your bladder, but at the same time, you don't want to go too often just in case. Because if you keep going just in case, when your bladder hasn't had a chance to stretch, just like any muscle, it will tend to get tighter and tighter. A bit like my hamstrings get tighter and tighter. <laughs> if I keep emptying my bladder just in case, eventually my bladder starts to sort of shrink and not be as stretchy. So it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It's fine to hold on. And you will get your first warning to empty your bladder when the bladder is only about half full. That's how a normal bladder should, should warn you. I'm about half full. It would be convenient if there was a toilet around now. And it's a good time to go if it happens to be a break. But you should be able to hold on for quite a lot longer before your bladder is really, really full and you're busting. And the same applies for the kids in your class. It's not just for the teachers. Expecting a little kid with a little bladder to hold on for excessive lengths of time can cause problems as well. So they need to be able to access the toilet when they really need to go. Thank you. Meryl, do you have anything Agreed. to add? I think uh, Terry has actually covered that very well. Lovely. Thank you. Well, um, this one I will actually direct to you, Meryl, and it's um, a similar type of issue around holding on to an amount of urine. However, as a, a female who's obviously still menstruating, they find that they're having difficulties for about one week per month in holding on to their urine capacity. Um, is that normal? Are there any strategies to help? Um, well, it's not uncommon. And um, I know having worked with um, Euro, in the urogyne department at the women's that um, a lot of women don't have necessarily have issues um, in regards to that. But uh, for a lot of women, the week before their period, they might get some urgency, frequency, um, the change in the hormone levels in the pelvic floor. Um, so it's a matter of watching what happens, making sure possibly that you're not having too much um, caffeine, tea and coffee or cola drinks during that time. You might have to change what you're doing, um, drink a bit more water add water to that so you've got that less irritative um, sensation 
look at your pelvic floor and manage that, um, doing your pelvic muscle ex exercises so that you can control that sensation when you get the urge so that you're not going at the first sensation. And as Terry was saying, you know, you do get sensations at different times um, before you need to go to the toilet and learning how to control that, that sensation. So you can do a one-off pelvic muscle contraction so that that sort of calms that sensation down a little bit. There are little trigger points. There's a range of different things and it's worthwhile um, to get management. You could see a continence physio specialist so that you get managed appropriately and you know how to manage the symptom. Thank you. TJ, anything to add? Um, no, not not. Not, not more, I think. I think Meryl's uh, covered that very well. And um, I, I think sometimes uh, people do notice a change in their, um, in either their bladder or their bowels. Um, but if there is constipation, then I think um, manage that preemptively, you know. Um, if you find that uh, you're getting a bit constipated, then um, take, uh, take uh, say, a spoonful of uh, extra fiber or uh, increase that so that, because um, if you can predict this is going to happen, then preemptively sort of uh, manage that in advance. Thank you. Well, interestingly, we've had a, a reasonable amount of discussion so far today around constipation, but we have a query that's coming around the reverse situation where somebody has to deal uh, a fair bit with diarrhea um, and they're wanting to know the best way to deal with that. So I might start with you on this one, TJ. Oh, um, can I... Um... Maybe make this, I think it's about, maybe we will we, we'll, we'll look big first and then after we'll then come towards the more. Uh, so I think it's about making sure that the medical conditions that might cause diarrhea, if there's a change in the bowel habit, uh, if, the, if there's blood in the bowels, in the stools, uh, if there's a family history of malignancy or cancer, then I think, you know, uh, starting out with the GP uh, to say, look, this is something that's happening very often. Uh, this is very troublesome. Um, and, you know, have routine checks, okay? And let's just assume that uh, all of that is out of the way. It's, just, it's all benign. Uh, nothing has turned up uh, as worrying or that needs intervention then I think it's about making sure that uh, constipation is excluded firstly. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. it's overflow diarrhea, as we mentioned before, and this is um, and it's counterintuitive, mm -hmm. uh, but overflow diarrhea can often present as um, uh, diarrhea and, and incontinence. Um, so if it's constipation, we, we need to treat that. And we've, uh, we've spoken a lot about that over a few days with diet and fluids. Um, if it's uh, if we think it's something that uh, uh, there's all, too much fluid in the um, in the stools because of malabsorption, then it's about working out whether um, uh, using some extra uh, fiber might be able to soak that, some of that up. Uh, it's about making sure that we uh, uh, speak to maybe a pelvic floor physiotherapist uh, to see if uh, the defecation uh, dynamics is uh, uh, optimum. Um, what do the other uh, panelists um, think? I agree. I think uh, diarrhea, the first step is to make sure you've had all the necessary tests. You don't want to miss something and that is vital to, to do that. So absolutely agree with TJ. And then to look at um, what's triggering that diarrhea. And Meryl said earlier about time toileting for the elderly gentleman. And she mentioned going to the toilet 20 minutes after a meal. Now, often uh, a meal can be a trigger for something we call the gastrocolic reflex. So it can actually trigger the need to go to the toilet. So if you know that your bowel action is triggered by a meal and you're going to have a meal and then hop on a train and rush off somewhere, perhaps you need to actually leave a 20 minute gap to allow yourself to cope with that or delay your meal until you get to the destination where there's a toilet. So you can actually work with your body in a lot of ways. Um, there, there lots, there's so many things we can do here. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a weekend seminar. Um, there's lots we can do. I get really excited about that because there's so much we can fix. Mm. We can, yes. uh, fecal incontinence is devastating. And, and Meryl would, would, can talk a bit about that. The, the, the limited yeah. products 
they are. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely devastating. And we it make is. so much difference. It's, it's the best part of being in confidence is sorting out these little problems. Mm -hmm. So go and see someone, definitely. Yeah, I agree. Um, and as TJ said, you've got to work out whether it's constipation with overflow or diarrhea in a loose stool. And people often think because the stool's loose that they're, they're, um, they've got diarrhea when actually you've got to work out what you're actually treating. So we get a lot of uh, calls to the helpline saying I've got diarrhea um, and they want something to treat it, but you really need to speak with your GP, work out exactly what's going on so that you treat it appropriately because a lot of people think they've got diarrhea, so they go to the chemist, they buy the gastro stop, everything gets bunged up and they actually put themselves in a far worse position and then they start having bladder issues as well as bowel issues because they've done the wrong thing, thinking they're doing the right thing. So it's always wise to seek help, get the right management and get a referral to a service that can assist you. Thank you. Um, Bronwyn, there was a related yes. question on this. Can I answer it? Of course you can. And there was a related question I saw earlier about somebody who has the same problem um, of needing to go every time they go for a run. Mm. and asking if that's normal oh, and there have been another lot of poo joggers in the media as well so we all know it, it happens it's not appropriate to go in, in somebody's doorstep and it is really really common anyone who works with with people who run marathons and who do a lot of running will know that those toilets at the start of the marathon are really important and a lot of runners it, it's another trigger for a gastrocolic reflex that's a really common one. So try and time your meals so that you've got a bit of time to go. And it can be really worthwhile doing a warm up to trigger what you know is going to happen, which is actually a fairly normal body reaction. So go for a warm up run, go back home, finish what you need to do at home, and then go for your main run. If you know it happens and you know it happens like clockwork five minutes into your run, work out your route. Go for a warm-up run and, and work with your body. That's Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, a bit of a shift now to a, a problem that um, I know impacts on a lot of married couples um, uh, that you tend to be more aware when your partner is getting up during the night and needing to go to the toilet. So what happens when uh, you are incontinent and you wake up at about 3 a.m., um, you're slightly incontinent even before you get to the bathroom? How are we going to manage a situation like this? Oh, um, may I take this one? Absolutely, TJ. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so... Um, the waking, waking up to pass urine is called uh, nocturia uh, or waking up at night to pass urine. And um, it can be for many reasons. And um, what trying to understand firstly, uh, what's normal um, and what's uh, problematic. So it's, there is no normal. Normal is what it is for you. For some people, it's a waking up none, and they will, um, and that's normal for them. And sometimes it's waking up one time or two times. But the thing is that how bothersome is it? It tends to occur. It only becomes a lot more bothersome when it is waking up uh, between one and two times. Now it's different, obviously, for everyone. But if we try to work out uh, why people wake up overnight to pass urine, it can be relating to the bladder. If the bladder is a very small uh, capacity or an overactive bladder uh, that is uh, spasming or, or, or contracting uh, frequently as well as before it's reached capacity, then it might be that the person might wake up um, throughout, uh, through, through the night. Uh, during the daytime, people uh, will then have um, some uh, overactive bladder symptoms. Now, it is also dependent on how much uh, urine is being produced. And so if uh, someone has drank a lot of fluids in the evening or uh, take uh, some things that are diuretics like coffee, tea, uh, alcohol in the evening, then that will produce a lot of urine. 
Uh, some things that can also uh, increase the urine production at night is going to be um, swelling in the legs, which is very common. Uh, and if uh, when you lie down, then the fluids magically di disappear tomorrow. It, it's gone somewhere. It's gone back into the circulation. And so then the kidneys produce a lot more urine. Um, there are also some cardiac or, or uh, respiratory uh, as well as sleep conditions uh, and sometimes uh, and also mood and so if someone's always worried um, uh, anxious or depressed they they have and people have interrupted sleep cycles or sleep quality and so they tend to uh, wake up a lot more and to try to go back to sleep then they go to the toilet preemptively uh, sometimes it's about pain. Uh, people, you know, people uh, wake up because of that, and so they toilet preemptively. So there are many, many, many reasons for um, why people wake at night to pass urine, and it's about trying to work out which one, um, which factors, and there might be multiple factors uh, in at play here um, before we address each one individually. Meryl, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think TJ covered that very, mm -hmm. very well. And it is an individual thing. And as he said, sometimes, you know, we wake up, we go to the toilet. So trying to use some little strategies and um, little deferral measures, doing a pelvic muscle contraction, as Terry will probably say, so that you don't actually, just because you're awake, doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go to the toilet and that can become habitual so that you know if you're waking two, three, four times and you don't have a full bladder sensation, you go to the toilet anyway and then that becomes part of um, a cycle that uh, then becomes a little bit less healthy because if you're not actually got a large bladder full and it's just a small amount, uh, your bladder becomes smaller as Terry was yeah. describing before and so your ability to hold on longer and get through the night is going to change as well. So uh, it is individual as TJ was saying, with the yeah. different medical conditions, that's it. But um, if they, there's no other underlying medical condition that might be causing it, it might just be habitual and not going just in case um, is equally as important during the day as it is at night. Terry, anything to add? Um, just the, the, the use of a bladder diary can tell us so much. So this person probably should be seeking help to try and find out why they're going so much. And in measuring exactly what is happening, how much urine is being produced, how often, you know, can they write down a time, could someone record? Because the partner's recording it's, it, that the person's getting up all the time. Well, do we know what times those are? And, you know, who's, who's really disturbed? Is it the partner or the person going? Um, so having a bladder diary is so useful. And it just means that when you do go and see someone to try and unravel what's happening, They've got some information to start with. You know, mm. What time did you go? How much was there? It, you know, how much urine did you produce? And if you don't want to measure it all the time during the night, even just getting a, a, an overall, you know, do every wee into a bucket and then measure at the end of the day gives us better than nothing. Mm. Um, mm. So measure in the morning and, and at least we, we have something to start with. And TJ is the absolute king on nocturia. What his department work with all the time. I wouldn't say so. king, but yes, <laughs> our, our department. Yes, uh, uh, Bronwyn, yeah. I'll say that Definitely. I think you you have a bladder diary um, on the uh, continue, the CFA website, we and do. that's quite yes. Uh, yes. Uh, readily available, which can uh, give you know people can download that and they can use that as a record. Uh, it's really about uh, how much people have taken in, so it's an intake of uh, what time did you drink and what did you drink? And then on the uh, other side of the sheet, it's going to be about what time did you go to the toilet and how much mm -hmm. urine did you pass out? Um, sometimes we, we have a lot of questions about, oh, uh, this is very complicated to try to collect this urine. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, we, we suggest to people, look, if it's a, a male, then it's uh, into a, maybe a urinal bottle, if that's something mm -hmm. available. Otherwise, uh, that can be into you know, any bottle or receptacle. Mm -hmm. uh, in a female, sometimes we, we find a large ice cream bucket <laughs> that you uh, can put into the toilet bowl, maybe a good way of, um, uh, of collecting this and then tipping this into the cheapest um, um, measuring jug that you can buy. Um, and look, you know, this, this, 
<laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the, the bladder diary is not really about trying to understand, did you pass out 237 mils? It's not, it's not that, it doesn't need to be that precise. But what we do need to understand is, are volumes that passed really 50 mils? Or is it 250 mils? Or is it 500 mils? You know, you sort of want a rough sort of sense uh, of the volumes. And of course, we understand day to day is going to be different. Uh, but, you know, we get a sense of over maybe 48 hours or 72 hours, then um, uh, you, can, you can get very, very good information and make very, very uh, uh, simple uh, changes um, to the management sometimes, or you can direct management so much. It's, it's cheap and it's, it doesn't cost one cent. <laughs> I have a very clever tip for um, the, those of the audience who are um, keen mathematicians. I have a little bathroom scale in my bathroom that has an LED light. It measures to an accuracy of 100 grams. And I know that 100 grams is equal to 100 milliliters. So if you weigh yourself before you pee and then weigh yourself after you pee and measure the difference, you don't have to collect the stuff. It's not accurate. We know it's not accurate. But it's, we know whether it was 100 or thereabouts or whether it was 500 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. It's enough mm. for an initial um, purpose. Thanks. That's Terry. a good way of doing it. Yeah. Mm. That's uh, a good there suggestion. Are, there are also many apps that you, that you can download these days and that can help you record this. Uh, especially if it's overnight, you don't want to turn on the lights and you know, scribble something <laughs> down. Uh, look, you know, there are apps that can help uh, if that, that suits the person. I was wondering if part of that, and I know with the, the um, bladder diaries, sometimes bladder diaries ask you to put down the type of fluid. And I was just thinking um, quite often in the evening, you might have some uh, fizzy drinks or some additional wine, or some people might be having a, an evening cup of coffee, those sorts of fluids that you're taking in, but in fact have an adverse effect on the bladder. Do those um, can contribute to nocturium? Uh, they can do, definitely. Like everyone's different. Like I, I know people who won't have a cup of coffee after four o'clock in the afternoon or even midday because they feel that that has an effect. So mm. some people can have coffee just before they go to bed, have mm. no effect at all. Uh, it's working out what happens with the individual and with the bladder diary, it gives you a, a good idea. So on the nights where they might have a, um, a glass of wine or a whiskey or whatever, that might be the night that creates the problem. So mm. having that beverage earlier in the evening, um, before dinner rather than after dinner, um, changing what you're doing to, to accommodate. Because we're not always talking about eliminating everything. Mm. Life is really important. There's enjoyment mm. in all of those different fluids. And you don't want to be strict restricting people so that they you're removing all of the positive things in their life and the mm. things that create happiness for them, mm. um, for their management. So it's mm. always going back to looking at the individual and working out the best way of managing so that um, they can still have enjoyment as well. Thanks, Meryl. The, the bladder diary answers the question, actually answers the whole problem to the, the person involved as well. I've mm. had somebody come to me with severe problems and when they did a bladder diary, Turns out they were drinking three or four pots of beer after dinner. And I just showed it to him and we looked at it together and I said, I think you know what the problem is. And unfortunately I lost a client. But he knew what the problem was. And he was able to sort it out or not as per his choice. You know, yeah. I can't fix yeah. what he's yeah. drinking Can after I, dinner. And I, yeah. he just needed to see it in writing. Yeah, and yes. I think that's right. It's about identifying what it is. And once you identify it, and then people can make choices and mm. they can decide for themselves. Yeah, definitely. I had a similar client quite some time ago, and he would have three 600 mils of coffee before 10 a.m. in the morning. And he was a very active person. And then he'd come home and he'd have another um, big pot of tea in the afternoon. And then he'd have a bottle, share a bottle of wine with his wife um, over me. dinner. He'd have a whiskey before he had dinner. So just reviewing his fluid content and minimizing what he was having um, made a huge difference. But he, he was very motivated to do the right thing because his wife had seen a continence physio and she had the background to support him with that. And so it ended up being a very 
positive experience and he was really grateful for all of the the tips and the pelvic floor and management and everything. So he saw the continence physio as well. And he, he said it turned his life around. Yeah. Well, it turned his and his wife's life around. Yes. And I think that was yeah. a really important thing for both of them. Yeah. I, I think when, it, and when things are identified, then people actually then understand uh, why this is happening and then they have choices. And I think one of the, the uh, most challenging parts of, of the incontinence is that there's sometimes the, the lack of control. And, uh, um, mm. and, and that's why if we can take back some of, these contro- some of the control, then I think people uh, feel more empowered in uh, managing uh, their condi- uh, the, the condition. Mm. Thank you. Um, slightly different tack now. And uh, we've got a query regarding going to see the doctor when you believe you have um, stress urgency incontinence, what's the GP going to be able to do for an individual who goes along to see them? That'd be a good one for Terry. Uh Um, Hey, TJ, you got some tips? Um, I think the uh, I think seeing your GP in the first instance is a wonderful thing because first your GP um, uh, cannot may or may not necessarily ask you uh, about these qu- these questions, and then if you uh, raise this with the GP, then the GP has an opportunity to intervene and to help. Uh, they will, they can take a history and try to understand um, where to direct your um, direct things. Uh, they may themselves have very good information uh, then, and skills to assist you with the uh, assist the person with uh, with the condition. They can review all their medical conditions, their their medications, um, and. And maybe even start some initial uh, management for some of the precipitating factors. Now, if necessary, then they can direct you to um, a, a, a continence nurse or a continence a pelvic fl- floor physiotherapist. Uh, they can direct you to all of the numerous uh, services that are available. Point you to Continents Foundation of Australia, link you in with the uh, with government assistance uh, financially and uh, also equipment wise. Um, it's it's uh, it's wonderful to even have the opportunity to uh, engage and to um, uh, try to help. So please talk to your GP about it um, because then only then can they help. Yeah, I I agree with TJ. Um, it's amazing how many people think it's normal to have incontinence, mm. even if it's only a very small amount. And so they don't think it's, um, you know, they manage with one pad and it's fine. So they don't think it's necessary to speak to the GP. Whereas actually the sooner that they speak to their GP and work out a plan of management, um, the quicker improvement so that um, possibly they may not even have any incontinence after treatment and management. And it's mm. something much more simple and it takes a bit of motivation on the person's behalf. Mm. So asking the question and speaking about it, Um, trying not to be embarrassed about it because a lot of people think, oh, I'm too embarrassed, I've got leakage, but I don't want to speak to anyone. Uh, And it's actually really important to speak to the GP and say, Mm. I've got this problem, it's just minor. Is there something that I can do to improve it? Thank you. Absolutely, it could be a really quick fix. Um, I had a horrific experience myself. I was on a particular medication And within three days of starting it, I was having terrible stress and urge incontinence. And it was a very unusual side effect of the medication. It was not one I would have picked up. The GP got it straight away and we changed the medication. So I know what it's like to have that devastating. Um, The other thing is, um, it, it happens, and I'm sure TJ and Meryl have had this story as well, we have people who come to us with a little bit of incontinence that's been bothering them for a while. And when you ask how long it's been, they say, oh, just since my last child was born. And when you ask how long, how old the last child is, they <laughs> often say, say 30. 30. Yep. 30 <laughs> yes, it's very age. common. Mm. And they've been having problems for 30 years. And we, mm. we improve them. Mm. And had they come to yeah. us 30 years yes. ago, they would have saved themselves 
30 years yes. of embarrassment. Yes. 30 yes. years of landfill. Yes. You know, it's yes. just so important mm. to seek help early. Mm. We can help yeah. people at any age. It's never mm. too late. I've had 95-year-old yeah. people with stress incontinence who've improved with pelvic floor mm. exercise, but they need to do it correctly. Yeah. Really important. One in three people do get it wrong. And unfortunately, the most people who are most likely to get it wrong are the people who actually have incontinence. Mm. That's why they're having incontinence is because they are the ones that get it wrong. So really yeah. important to get that help. Some GPs can actually assess your pelvic floor. Not all. It's a specialist mm. area, but some of them have a really, really deep interest mm. and they can assess it and others will refer you on mm. to have it. Thanks, Thank Terry. It doesn't oh, always, uh, it, uh, I'll just uh, add also, it doesn't always mean that it's going to be complicated treatment and it doesn't mean mm -hmm. that uh, it's going to end up in surgery. Uh, it's, there are so many more steps in between. There's so many more steps in between mm -hmm. before you even talk or even consider uh, invasive or surgery. Mm -hmm. There's so many things you can do because it's uh, so things to improve um, and sometimes just minimal changes uh, is sufficient to make a very very big difference so thank you well on the theme that terry was talking about we, we've had quite a few questions around the pelvic floor um, but there was um, a couple that caught my eye in particular so several questions around whether correct pelvic floor exercises can help with things such as escaping flatulence and with urge incontinence. So let's just take those to begin with, Terry. Absolutely. Um, so the pelvic floor muscles help to support and reinforce the urinary sphincter and the, um, the anal sphincters. So we do have special little muscles that hold on to the urine and, and feces, but the pelvic floor muscle is the bigger muscle that supports those underneath. So the better you have control of that support structure, the better the little sphincters are going to be able to work and they reinforce the action. Mm -hmm. So the obvious one, it helps with stress incontinence because that's caused by um, pressure put down onto those little sphincters from activity or coughing or sneezing. But if you have urge incontinence, which um, I think Marilyn and, and TJ have already mentioned, is actually due to the bladder itself being irritated and trying to squeeze everything out. It may not stop that urgency. That needs further addressing. It, it might be behavioral changes. It might be lifestyle changes. It may mean that you need medication. But if you have strong pelvic floor muscles, you'll still have the urgency, but you won't wet on the way. And there's really good evidence that if you contract your pelvic floor muscles, it actually helps to relax the bladder temporarily until you can get there. So there's so many positives to learning that. And yes, it will help you to hold on to flatus for a bit longer. It'll also help with your erectile function and sexual function. So there are huge advantages to pelvic floor exercise. It increases the blood flow in the area. Um, so wonderful things. If you no longer can hold on in the lift, now we're only two people in a lift, but, so they'll know it's you. If you're in a lift with someone else, they'll know it's you. Um, you need to be able to hold on, at least until you get to the floor you're going to and can get out into a private space. So you won't hold on to massive amounts of platers for very long because platers is natural. It does need to come out eventually. But if you can hold on to it for that three to five minutes so that you're not embarrassing yourself in front of your, your colleague or, or a stranger, um, it can be really, really mm -hmm. helpful. Just to round out, because we are almost out of time, who can believe that we've nearly been talking about this <laughs> subject for almost an hour? Terry, is it ever too late to start thinking about doing pelvic floor exercises? Never. They're muscles. They're muscles under our control, so we can strengthen them. In the same way that we can strengthen our leg muscles or our arm muscles, we can strengthen the pelvic floor muscles at any age. I have taught my mother to do her pelvic floor exercises. It was a few years ago. I taught her over the phone. You can hear I, I'm not from Australia. So I had to teach her over the phone and she was successful in learning it at the age of 75. The oldest patient I have seen um, to teach pelvic floor exercises was 95 and we made a big difference. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah right. and I agree with Terry. Um, the oldest of my my clients, it was a an elderly couple in their 90s, still independent at home, cooking, gardening, growing their own vegetables, um, really healthy diet. And she was 93 and he was 94. And she had 100% um, improvement. Uh, he had probably about 75% um, improvement, but he had um, prostate issues that um, became evident that needed management and yeah. treatment. So um, any age is a good age. There's no barrier. Yeah. Thank uh, you. I had a I had a 92 year old lady since we're sharing stories. Yes. Who, who, I, who I said, look, uh, there's an option of phys uh, pelvic floor physiotherapy or medications. And I said, what would you like? And she said, let me try some physio first. We came back three months later. Control say wonderful see you later you never need medications because you've already achieved your goal um, with these uh, lesser intervention uh, not say lesser but less invasive uh, interventions so it's a yeah. wonderful outcome i think the yes, it is. thing is that if it's not working then you need to find out why it's not working as i mentioned one in three people can't do it right Hmm. and have to be taught and unfortunately a larger percentage of the people who are having incontinence issues will be in that group that can't do it without help hmm. and there's lots of ways of teaching it um, some of them require an examination some don't hmm. sometimes it's just getting the right picture seeing them some people hmm. don't even know where their pelvic floor is yes I, I think that is such a positive message for us to finish up today's q a um, I would really like to take this opportunity on behalf of the Foundation to thank our three panellists, TJ, Terry and Meryl. Thank you so much for the time, uh, your commitment to working with such a diverse client groups uh, around incontinence and for your time today. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, a reminder to all those watching today, we do have the National Continence Helpline and that number again is 1-800-33-00-66. So please don't hesitate to call them and you may be lucky enough to get to speak to Meryl.